Sorry I'm late. Staff Sergeant Dignam is our liaison to the undercover section. His undercover work is extensive. He's here to give us his report, Sergeant Dignam. Okay. My people are out there. They're like fucking Indians. You're not gonna see them, you're not gonna hear about them, except through me or Captain Queenan. You will not ever know the identity of undercover people. Unfortunately, this shithole has more fucking leaks than the Iraqi Navy. Fuck yourself. I'm tired from fucking your wife. How's your mother? Good, she's tired from fucking my father. Good. Today, girls, what I have for you is microprocessors. Somebody, as you may already know, stole 20 microprocessors from the mass processor company out on Route 128. These are the kind of processors they put into computers that could put a cruise missile up the ass of a camel from a couple hundred miles away. These little pieces of plastic are worth about 100 grand a piece. Now get this, we got a guy working for the company two months, walks right out the front door with a box of processors on Tuesday, has a ticket book for Florida on Wednesday, but on Thursday, he gets found in a dumpster. You know where that dirt ball started his life? Salty Projects. What was his name? The Departed. Miles Kennefick got the job to forge UMass transcript. UMass Boston, which happens to South be South Boston? In. Oh, you're a fucking genius, huh? Who forged your transcript, dickhead? Hey, this guy's, uh, his old man runs the Hibernian liquor mod, Kennefix. We're not here to solve the case of the missing scumbag. We're here to nail Costello. All right, look. I got a guy who says he hears Costello's moving the process to China. He set up the whole fucking job and popped Kennefick. You do not want to miss it if Costello takes a dump. We'd miss a lot less if you made your informants available to us and, of course, to the Bureau. Without asking for too many details, do you have anyone in with Costello presently? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe fuck yourself. My theory on feds is they're like mushrooms. Feed them shit and keep them in the dark. You girls have a good day. <laughs> Normally, he's a very uh, nice guy. Tonight, we'll discuss the New Bedford serial killer, and joining us will be a special guest, Aaron Cadu, who is producing a documentary series on the subject. 11 women were slaughtered and dumped on the highway within 18 months. 10 of those women had children. All of them were someone's child, someone's sister, someone's friend. They were all vulnerable, people who had fallen on hard times. Serial killers prey on those type of women for one reason, because they're easy targets. But other types of women are, are easy targets too. We discussed one last episode, Sandra Birchmore, and Dave has very important news on that. I'm going to bring him on in a second so we can talk about it and so we can continue to make our plea for new information because it's working. People are reaching out. You've heard a lot on this channel about corrupt police investigations, but as we've also said over and over and over, the vast majority of cops get into it because they want to be on team good guys. No one is more frustrated than they are when they see injustice. However, it is hard for them to reach out because there's the whole thin blue line thing. Yet they are reaching out. The maddening thing about the Birchmore case is that if Sandra was murdered, there's almost no chance of ever bringing justice to the killer. The investigation is over. As Mizzy revealed the other night, a state trooper who was a former Stoughton police officer was sent to interview the suspect. The Stoughton officer seen on the surveillance going into her apartment hooded and masked moments before her alleged suicide. So it would appear the fix was in from the start. It's hard to overcome that. Some superior had to send in that former Stoughton cop. It wasn't a matter of drawing stars, star, uh, straws. Did this color the determinations made by the medical examiner? We can't know, but we'd be, we'd be naive to think it didn't. She would have known that there were powerful players involved. No one has to explicitly order the code red in situations like this, whether it's mob bosses or powerful and dangerous police authorities, the people understand what's expected of them. I spoke with someone the other day from Canton who knows a lot of the players in this case and in the Karen Reed case. He had some interesting thoughts and information. We'll go over it later tonight after the discussion of the new Bedford serial killer. But perhaps the best we can do for Sandra Birchmore is to continue to expose the suspect nature of the investigation, highlight any irregularities. We might not be able to do anything for Birchmore, but maybe we can help the next one, the next victim of corrupt exploitation by keeping a spotlight on this. So if you're on Team Good Guys, keep reaching out.
So let's go now to Dave, our crack investigator, and see what he's got. Hopefully he's in here, and uh, he is not in here. <laughs> Dave, where are you, brother? Uh, I'm not sure if he's if we can find him. Oh, there he is. I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> it wasn't showing on my screen for some reason. I had to scroll down. Good evening, everyone. Um, how are you, Kev? Good good evening to uh, everybody well. in the chat. Um, just a couple things. We did, obviously, we did the Birchmore episode um, last night or the night before, and the Team Good Guys reached out, right? We have people reaching out to us who are within the Stoughton Police Department, um, reaching out to us, talking about things about Matt Farwell that may or may not have big, um, you know, um, repercussions on this case or little interesting things that we wouldn't think of that only would be known to people who know him. Yeah. One of the most interesting things that I've come across is Matt Farwell was one of those guys like myself, I'm not going to lie about it, who was heavily against masks. Matt Farwell never wore a mask uh, during COVID. In fact, he would, he was well known to be that guy who walked through the stores and bullshit with everyone when they went after you for wearing the not wearing the mask. You remember those days, you know, 2020, 2021, where they were like, everybody's got to wear your mask. And there was that one or two guys who were holdouts. Um, Matt Farwell was one of those guys. He he was vehemently against COVID masks. And a lot of people in that department, a lot of people who know him, found the most curious thing about that surveillance footage would be that Matt Farwell was wearing that COVID mask that he was so vehemently against. So what about that time and there's a surveillance footage there of, you know, little Sandra Birchmore, um, uh, a young lady who was taken advantage of by guys like Robert Devine, Matthew Farwell, Joshua Heal. And, you know, I don't think this is any like kind of big bombshell, but I think it was a very interesting point that could only be known to the people who actually knew Matt Farwell and that he was so vehemently against COVID masks that he chose this moment to wear a COVID mask when he knew that he would be on camera in the foyer there of um, Sandra Birchmore's uh, lobby as he went up on, on the last night of her life. So the people who reached out to me and gave me that little tidbit I thought was really, really interesting. And um, I can also confirm too that Matt, um, uh, he did get fired from TSA um, in Baltimore. He moved his family when his daughter was in senior year of high school. So she had gone to, uh, to high school with her, her, her friend group forever and, and, and left during um, senior year. So they, they up and moved real quick. And now he's in New Mexico. He couldn't be farther away from the situation, close to the Mexican border, where if shit gets hot, maybe he can just uh, get over quick. So again, you know, I don't think it's a bombshell, but I think it's interesting to note that Matt Farrell was very much against masks. And here he is, knowing he's going to be on surveillance, wearing a mask. And um, kind of makes you think you're not around anybody it's a litter later on at night here's a guy who's against it you know and wearing one um you know i didn't think that matt farwell killed sandra birchmore until i saw that surveillance footage and think about all the times in your life where you wanted to get somewhere fast and how did you move and how did you behave and and that that really says a lot to me that that footage says a lot to me. I think I'm almost on team. He killed her and he's able to live his life in New Mexico. Billy is able to live in Northeast and Robert Devine is, is allowed to just, you know, live out his time as a lawyer in Easton. And what are we doing about it? So the plea that we're making now is for more people to come forward to us. Maybe you're in that department. Maybe you knew him growing up. You know, I got a lot of people reaching out to me who grew up with them and say, you know, these guys were not good guys. They were jerks. They were assholes. They, were, they, they weren't popular. They were actually loners. Um, we need more details about Matt Farwell and Billy Farwell. And we need more people to, to be the good guy, to be the hero, to go against the grain. And, and, and if you know something, tell us. That way we can do what we do, which is present it to the audience in a way that's fair and understandable and important because the public needs to know. And uh, if you're out there right now watching this, like some people were the other night and reached out to us, you know, continue to do that, continue to do that. Cause we need to fill in more of these blanks. The COVID thing, the mass thing is just another little titillating point about Matt Farwell that none of us could have known unless you knew him. So that's very important to us. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to say that. And again, Sandra Birchmore, 
23 year old girl pregnant month, you know, um, not too far along in her pregnancy, dead, dead of suicide because these monsters took advantage of her and we can't allow that to happen. Right. And as you know, it's one of those things where you're almost never going to get the kind of evidence you would need to show whether it was murder or suicide at this point. It's just probably impossible to get. But one thing you can get is evidence for a seriously corrupted investigation just by pointing out to any irregular irregularities, um, discrepancies, unusual ways that the vacation, that the um, investigation was handled. Um, no, anybody so that can I, point to that stuff out. Yep, go ahead. If I could interject on you, pal, I apologize. We want to know who this guy was that interviewed Farwell. Like, we want to know how that got to the point where a former Stoughton cop who had knowledge of Matt Farwell was the guy who ended up being the investigator on the case, interviewing him in a vehicle in a parking lot. We deal with a botched investigation at the very least on the Karen Reed case. Me and you can agree that the investigation was is bungled from the get go. Right. 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 Um, we can at least agree on that. You know, never mind Google searches or any other stuff that we bang out um, that we bang it out on. But the one thing we definitely agree on is that this fucking thing was blown from the beginning. And why does it continue to happen where we look at these cases where the investigations are blown from the beginning? Yeah, the names are misspelled. You're interviewing people in parking lots, you know, and you have guys who shouldn't be involved in the case who are friendly with these guys. Michael Proctor, you know, uh, um, you know, this other gentleman now that that we're getting on to. We need to know who these people are. We need to find out how they get assigned, what's going on, what, and how, how these discussions went down. I mean, all these mechanisms we need to know because the public should know. I mean, every, every it should be total transparency on everything. And we're not getting that. We're not getting that in Reed. We're definitely not getting that in Birchmore. And we need that. So, again, if you're out there and you want to be the hero, get in contact with us. Plenty of people have. And, and it's it's awesome. The power of this show. I mean, people see it and they immediately get with us because they want to do the right thing. People overall are good. They're good people. I think there's way them. more heroes out there in law enforcement than villains. Way more. That's myself. I've known a lot of cops in my life. I think it's difficult to cross the line. Oh, did did we lose you, Dave? Uh, uh, like he, no, I, I apologize. You. I'm here. I'm just muting if, uh, if someone needs to talk to me or something like that. I apologize. Oh, okay. I, or, right. uh, okay. Anyways, uh, I think there's way more heroes. And there's a lot of heroes, guys in the background that want to be heroes. They're frustrated by what they see. But these corrupt investigations that involve police wrongdoing, they're serious things. And this is where you get, when you have, in the Birchmore case, whether or not she committed suicide or was murdered, there's no question that she was victimized since she was an underage girl in a systemic way by multiple guys on, on these police forces. And I'm sure there were an awful lot of police officers there who were watching this and seeing it and were repulsed by it. And you're kind of in a tough, tough spot where you don't want to say anything. But now when it comes down to something where a girl, I mean, wasn't that Sandra in that video there that was walking into the elevator with a snow removal device? Yeah. Yes. I mean, you don't do that if you're planning suicide. And also, I'm, um, you know, we're getting a lot of stories from people that Sandra absolutely loved her cats and there was no way in hell that she would commit suicide and allow her cats to find her. As crazy as that sounds, you know, whatever. I'm not here to judge. People love their animals. And everything about this young lady in the time frame pointed towards the fact that she was not suicidal. She was looking forward to the baby. Regardless of Matt Farwell was going to sign the birth certificate or not, she was going to have his baby. And... She had a lot of things in life to look forward to. This guy shows up 20 minutes later, he's out the door and then she's dead. I just don't understand. Uh, sorry, the kids are getting loud. Um, <laughs> I apologize to everybody. And I know everyone's going to say, come on, Dave, go somewhere where they're not. Well, they're daddy's boys. I apologize. For the most yeah. part, they're quiet. Um, Connor loves to hang around daddy. Connor likes dad. And um, the bottom line is this, you know, we talked to a lot of LEOs and the... I know in your in your case and mine, the, the vast majority of them say, it's just no fucking way she did this. No way. And so what are we doing? Are we going to keep pressing it or are we going to are, are we going to keep pressing this thing? Or are we just going to let it die? Karen Reed, nobody, no, everybody kept pressing it, pressing it, pressing it. Look what's happening. Same thing with Birchmore. We got a little girl dead. So, yeah. 
Um, do we want to move on or are we ready to get Go on? Go ahead and move on, um, do the interview, okay. and then I'm just going to hit mute for a few minutes so I can do one thing. So please go ahead. Sure. And we're going to come back after we're going to analyze the ridiculous video that was on a channel the other night where there were multiple people discussing the Karen Reed case and just absolutely ridiculous. So me and Dave are going to go over that uh, point by point later. Um, but I want to just mention now, I usually don't like to ask, but you could really help us out by clicking subscribe. We'd like to be in the 5,000 club. So help us out. Share us on social media if you want. Maybe we can get there soon. Uh, also, if you'd like to support our documentary, Outer Demons, which focuses on the work of Dave McGrath and Melanie Perkins and others, we do appreciate it. You can donate here or with the PayPal. We'll link below shortly. Dave and I are doing a lot of shooting over the next several days and proceeds go immediately into the production. Now, I want to add something before we play the new Bedford clip that I have for some news accounts here. Michael Morrissey, the prosecutor for Norfolk County, was reelected in 2022 with 98% of the vote. 98%. Look, you can't get 98% agreement on anything. Saddam Hussein used to put up fake numbers like that in Iraq when he was trying to pretend to the world that his country was a democracy. In 2013, Morrissey was at fault in a multi-vehicle accident. He claimed he had a physical condition, which led to a fainting spell. He claimed tests showed no alcohol. He claimed that. Maybe. In fact, it, it uh, reminded me of a clip. There's no flight at 11 o'clock. What the fuck are you trying to pull? The first flight stateside left Guantanamo Bay at 2300. It arrived at Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, at a few minutes past two in the morning. Really? Then why isn't it listed in the tower chief's log? Jessup. What are you telling me? He fixed the logbook? Well, maybe he can make it so a plane didn't take off, but I can sure as hell prove that one landed. I'll get the logbook from Andrews. You're not going to find anything in the Andrews logbook either. He can make an entire flight disappear? Nathan Jessup is about to be appointed director of operations for the National Security Council. You don't get to that position without knowing how to sidestep a few landmines. Well, he's not going to be able to sidestep you. You don't still intend to put me on the stand. Thursday morning, 10 o'clock. So I can't help thinking that uh, 98%, I mean... That clip just reminded me too of the blood test. I'm not saying that Morrissey fixed the blood test, but I mean, Christ, just like Jessup fixed the the uh, the flight log. It is, interesting. Interesting. it is interesting to hear Michael Morrissey has this issue, you know, the the driving issue, yeah. and I mean, a lot of people, you know, I'm starting to think that this whole thing is just, and it starts with him. Like he's the main villain in my eyes right now in a lot of these cases, and I really hope that we can track down more on Morrissey because. Um, the fish usually rots at the head, and the and the rank and file guys are usually good, but the the leadership is corrupt, right? You look at the FBI with Christopher yeah. Ray, and it doesn't get any to, higher to be, than Michael Morrissey, you know. To be to be clear, we're not accusing him of anything. We're just no. saying this stuff's a little odd. He's not a guy that seems to be a very charismatic politician if you listen to him speak. And I'm not saying that the 98 percent is because the elections are rigged. You'll find numbers like that all over the state. It's because this state in most areas only has one party. So guys like Morrissey are selected by the party's corrupt leaders and there's no opposition. The primaries are usually irrelevant. If the people don't want democracy, then democracy becomes an illusion. In the vast majority of elections in this state, there is no choice. It's probably like that in many red states too. You vote for the people the party chooses for you or tough noogies. We're brainwashed by a monopolistic media and ideologically corrupt school systems. So most of us have no idea what they've done to us, what they're doing. If Michael Morrissey says his blood alcohol was zero, who are we to question it? If Michael right. Morrissey says Sandra Burt's more committed suicide and his office had absolutely no reason to be suspicious about the hooded masked cop that snuck in to see her moments before her death, who are we to be to question it? So let's, I got a clip here from the New Bedford things. And, and, and I think he ran, here. last point on that, I think he ran unopposed. I think there was nobody on the fucking ballot against him. Think about that. He did. That's how it is in most of the elections. That's how it is. That's how you get to more than 30 you have no years after the last victim was found. The New Bedford Highway murders terrorized the South Coast back in the 80s. 30 years ago this month, the dawn of one of the most horrific crimes this region has ever seen. Hey, Deborah Medeiros. The only
only suspect ever charged in connection with the serial highway killings in Massachusetts has died. 61-year-old Kenneth Ponte was found dead in his New Bedford home on Tuesday. Officials say his death does not appear to be suspicious. Ponte had been charged with murder after the remains of nine women were discovered along highways in southeastern Mass. However, he was cleared due to a lack of evidence. One victim's family believes the case is one tip away from being solved. Skeletal remains of a young woman have been found along a southeastern Massachusetts highway. Investigators hope the bodies of women started showing up in March of 1988. Eleven women go missing in six months. I called the police station. I told them I thought my sister had disappeared, that she wasn't around, and was told that I have to understand that junkies disappear all the time. All had disappeared from the same area in New Bedford. It was ludicrous not to admit that it was a serial killer. Now, no one has ever been charged for the murders, leaving a cloud of mystery hanging over southeastern Massachusetts for three decades. Such a bad feeling. Judy's sister, Nancy Piva, became the second victim of the New Bedford Highway Killer. The 36-year-old mom was last seen leaving a local bar. Her body was discovered weeks later off of 195 in Dartmouth. Former New Bedford police detective Richard Ferreira and his partner investigated Nancy's murder and connected her case to the others. I think we might have a serial murder around here. July 30th, 1988 dawned steamy and hot. Judy DeSantos and her family were on Route 195, returning from a day at a public pool to cool off and clear their minds. That's because Judy's sister, Nancy Piva, had been missing for weeks. As they passed through Dartmouth, Judy spotted a medical examiner's van on the side of the road. I just knew it was her. Over the years, police identified suspects, but no one was ever charged with the murders. The body of Nancy Piva was pulled from the woods that afternoon. She was one of 11 women who went missing between April and September 1988. It's the most difficult case I've ever investigated. The hardest thing for me is the families, and particularly the families of the two girls that we never recovered the remains of. That really haunts me. Investigators who worked on this case say with little physical evidence and no video, the best chance of solving this case will likely come down to a tip. For families, there were glimmers of hope as the police set their sights on a suspect, attorney Kenneth Pont. Absolutely not guilty, Your Honor. He knew all of the women who were found dead. He had ties to all of them. Pont was charged with the murder of one of the women, but the case against him was thin and charges of Eventually dropped, Pont died in 2010. Another suspect, Anthony DeGrazia, was never charged, but while under investigation, he took his own life in 1991. Hey guys, let me take that off. All right, and I'm going to bring in Aaron in a second, but first I just want to say thank you very much to Lauren. It's very The donation is very much appreciated, and it will go immediately to use um, as we're, we need to pay our camera crews for a lot of work coming up. Um, so let, this is Aaron Cadu. Cadu. Aaron, let, Cadu. Okay, Cadu. I'm sorry. I'm I was sorry. close, but no cigar. Hey, hey, how are you? What's up, Very buddy? good. Thanks for you guys joining us. Okay? Um, Oh, yeah. I'm gonna in a little while. Okay. I'm gonna show the trailer. Yeah, we can hear you good. I'm gonna show the trailer to your work. I mean, you got some re a really uh, fine project going on there. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. That's great stuff, Aaron. Really great. I saw the trailer for it earlier, man. That is awesome. Um, eight years in the making. <laughs> eight, I, I trust me. I I know all about it. Um, I did my book six years in the making. Um, anytime someone reaches out to me and said I read their book, read your book, it's just a, such a heartening feeling because you poured that much into it. Um, and I'm super interested to see it. When, it, when, it, when, when is this documentary going to be out? When, when can we Your see it? Your guess is as good as mine. We are, um, ah. so we built it as a seven part series. We have six episodes done okay. as far as we can get them. And now it's a matter of finding the right partner to help us get this to an outlet like an HBO or a Netflix or, okay. uh, something or an Amazon. Um, we feel that this is best served being in a streaming format with no commercial breaks. It's a slow sure. burn. Um, deep dive into this um, unsolved serial murder case. 
Um, uh, let me, if I could just um, grab the first question, Kev, if you can give me the briefest kind of overview of how you became interested in the case and I'll mute and let you talk. Um, well, I, I had, the only other project to my name to this point is a documentary I did in 2013 called the Bridgewater Triangle, which is about unexplained occurrences in Southeastern Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the people that we interviewed in that documentary was a retired, uh, Freetown detective who was involved in the highway murders investigation because three of the bodies were found in his jurisdiction in Freetown. Yep. And he had asked me what my next next project would be. And I try to pick local topics that can draw a national audience. So this, the New Bedford Highway murders was a local topic. That was a national story at the time. Nobody oh, has yeah. done a documentary on this case to this point. And so that's why uh, we set our sights on this as the next topic. Awesome. And, you know, I've done a lot of work on the Bridgewater Triangle. I'll send you a copy of my book. Uh, a lot of the people I write about in my book are, are Bridgewater uh, Treatment Center guys. Spent a lot of time there. I've interviewed people, obviously, from the treatment center, one of which who I thought at one point was actually a great uh, candidate for maybe a suspect of the New Bedford Highway killing. Um, certainly get to that if we have time. Um, I'm in, I'm, I guess before anything, give our audience, we got a bunch of people in watching live. Maybe someone doesn't know about this case. Um, can you give me a 30,000 foot view of, of the or a quick overview of the yeah. case to the lay person? Yeah, and it's funny. I was watching some of the news clips you had leading into it. And there was actually some incorrect things there, but um, in some of those uh, some of those news clips. But generally, um, between April and September of 1988, 11 women went missing from the streets of New Bedford. Over the course of the next year, leading into April of 1989, uh, nine of their bodies were found on the highways leading in and out of New Bedford, with three being found in Freetown, four being found in Dartmouth, one being found in Marion, and one being found in Westport. So all of the women were from New Bedford, but none of the bodies were found in New Bedford. Um, and the case went on to be the uh, largest manhunt in Massachusetts history. And it is the deadliest unsolved serial murder case in New England history. Now, did you grow up in the area? Did you, yeah, did I'm, you... I'm from Dartmouth, so I'm the next town over from New Bedford. So. I'm, I just turned 40. So anybody who's my age or older has probably at least heard of this case. I mean, if you're if you're my age or older and you haven't heard of this case, you probably have been living under a rock, especially if you were old enough to be paying attention to the news at that time. I mean, this was a national story. And just, for instance, in the New Bedford Standard Times newspaper in December of 1988, which was the first point where the case was at a fever pitch. 27 out of the 31 days of December, this story was a front page story in the paper. So it was, wow. it was quite a thing. I mean, it was, you know, like I said, national news, inside edition, uh, hard copy, all, all those show, all those news magazine shows from back then uh, touched on this case, including Geraldo, Maury Povich, all those guys, they all, they all delved into this. So this um, main suspect here, the lawyer, he was actually connected to all 11 of these women because I know they were all uh, drug addicts kind of down on their luck, maybe maybe possibly sex workers. or Yeah, so the universal commonality in all these women was that they were drug dependent. Um, some of them did have records for prostitution. Um, Kenneth Pont, you know, because he was a New Bedford attorney at the district court level, he did represent a few of these women. And to my knowledge, he knew at least seven, probably more. Um I've always thought that Kenneth Pont was better served as a witness than as a suspect. I personally do not feel he had anything to do. Totally with agree. Highway murders. Um, totally agree. This is Go a ahead. very small city of 100,000 people, which means the drug community within that city is even a smaller population of the city. These, it, To me, it suggests that if these women had ties to Pont, the killer was very likely somebody else from the city embedded in that drug community that Kenneth Pont may have even have known, but I just don't think he ever realized that that person was the killer. Um, and I think Kenneth Pont, I think he, everyone points to him and says, oh, well, he was he got really defensive and acted really squirrely. But I mean, the guy was a drug addict. He was no choir boy. Um, but um he was also a lawyer so i think he knew that if it came out that he was associating with prostitutes and using drugs he feared losing his law, uh, law license and he, he became an attorney and i believe 1981 it took him three times to pass the bar and he had already received the governor's pardon for turning his life around uh from a from a heroin addiction from the from the 70s and into the early 80s so um he was a success story and i think he feared a reputation for falling back into that lifestyle 
So the only evidence against him was the fact that he was connected to the women through the drug addiction, possibly through prostitution, and as and he represented some of them. So the main the main piece of evidence against him is the same piece of evidence that can be used to exonerate him for a string of serial murders. I think this was a traditional lone wolf serial killer. I don't think that there's all sorts of rumors of police corruption and, you know, was this a cop? Was it this? Was it that? This was. I don't want to say run of the mill, but this was a strangulation serial killer who was not caught. And Kenneth Pont was indicted on one of the we we say nine because two of these victims have never been found a presumed victim. So we have to say nine. He was indicted in the murder of one of these nine women. And it was a woman who he had spent time with in April of 1988, a few weeks before her disappearance. And the reason why Kenneth Pont was looked at was because this woman was a witness in an assault case involving Kenneth Pont, where Kenneth Pont allegedly pulled a gun on another individual and asked that guy if he had indeed raped Rochelle Clifford. So Kenneth Pont's with Rochelle. They're driving down the street. They see this guy on the side of the road. Rochelle says to Kenny Pont, hey, that that's the guy that raped me. So they get out of the car. Kenny Pont pulls a gun on the guy because Kenny Pont at the time was a deputy in the uh, uh, auxiliary deputy in the sheriff's department. He was a allowed to carry a gun. Yes, so he was. Um, he was a like Bristol County Sheriff's uh, Auxiliary yeah. Deputy, which I, um, it's a place where I've been employed for a good bit. Just last Yeah, was under Sheriff him. Nelson had appointed yep. him. And so he mm -hmm. could serve papers and things like that as a lawyer. So he had a gun. Yes. So he walked up to this guy, Roger Swire, who's now deceased, and said, did you rape Rochelle? And this confrontation ensues. Eventually, they part ways. Ro Rochelle and Kenny leave. And Roger Swire goes his way. But then he ends up pressing charges against Pont. And there was a New Bedford detective named John Dextrader who was assigned that case. And in the spring of 1988, he, he had seen Rochelle Clifford walking down the street and had approached her and said, Hey, um, are you willing to testify against Kenny Pont in this assault case? And she said, yes. And then late, I'm sorry, my cat walking across the screen here. <laughs> and then, um, uh, that was the last time she was reliably seen by anybody was April 27th. And the assault that in question was three weeks earlier. It took place on April 3rd. So the running theory from law enforcement was that Kenny Pont had killed Rochelle because she was going to testify against him in this assault case. But the problem with that is you are now attributing a motive to an accused serial killer. Serial killers do not yeah. have motives. They Their right. motive is their compulsion to kill, and that's it. Right. They don't kill for yes. jealousy, for, for money, for drugs, to keep mm -hmm. people quiet. And the other problem is you have to assume that Rochelle would have been the first victim, which we do not know for sure. And I don't actually think that she was because the timeline on so many of these women is so fuzzy. Now, granted, she was one of the first ones. But if Kenneth Pont killed Rochelle Clifford in April of 1988 to shut her up, why over the next four and a half months does he kill another 10? It makes no sense whatsoever. And people say, well, he killed the other 10 because he was going to shut them up because they knew too. Well, then why space the killings out over four and a half months? And just yeah, like no, there were crazy. women who knew, there were men who knew too, and only women were killed. None of the case against Kenneth Pond, <laughs> I'm sorry, made a she wasn't hit down here all day. And now this, uh, yeah, of none of the evidence they presented again against Kenneth Pond made a lick of sense. And I know you, guys, I heard you guys talking about the FBI earlier, and they do have their faults, but at the very least, their behavioral sciences unit has oh, yeah. extensive experience in serial murder, and they were never called in to assist in the highway murders investigation. The police here, Massachusetts State Police attached to the DA's office, the local police in the New, in the New Bedford and the local jurisdictions had no idea how to go about investigating a serial killer. They had, you know, New Bedford's a rough city with a lot of problems, but oh, had yeah. never seen anything like this. And they, I, it's my opinion, they just completely were in way over the head. They needed the help, the help of the FBI. The district attorney would have had to request that help. And the FBI was never brought in. And the FBI would not have taken over the investigation. That's a common misconception. The district attorney would have still retained control. It would have been a situation like in Atlanta when the child murders were going on and they, and they ended up getting Wayne Williams for that. The FBI yeah. had agents embedded in that investigation. And I think had the FBI been here, the first thing they would have told District Attorney Ronald Pina is get off Pont. It's not him. Yep. Specifically, um, John, uh, John Douglas, who was very, very involved in the Atlanta child murders, Wayne Williams. Um, and he was a behavioral science guy at the time. Is it possible, Aaron, that we have multiple killers? Do we I have doubt it? I mean, if you look at the statistics of serial killers, I think it's like one in 20 million is the chances of somebody being a serial killer. We are, we're dealing with a city of 100,000 people. 
-hmm. you know, there's, there's some people that say, well, what is, was it a copycat? Well, that was one of the running theories right. was that there was a serial killer and Kenny Pont killed Rochelle, the copycat. Well, the problem with that is these murders took place between April and September, but the general public was not aware that there was a serial killer. Even the police were not aware that there was a serial killer until the end of the summer, early fall. And the general public was not made aware of it until November or December of 1988. So the murders had been over for two months. So in order for somebody to be a copycat at the time that the murders were happening, they would have had to have known the other killer and known that person was killing women and knew where they were dumping the bodies. It, it's just it, it, it runs into the realm of, of being almost a statistical impossibility that, this, that any of these were a copycat and that they were multiple killers. Um, the, I think it's one in, one in 20 million chance of being a serial killer, a small city of 100,000 people. 1% of all murders across the country are serial murders. And in that 1%, 75% of the time, it's a lone wolf killer. And the other 25% of the time, if there's multiple killers, it's usually a sibling type situation. Sure. So the, the statistics and the, and the odds of it being multiple killers just don't, they don't make a lot of sense given the timeline and just general statistics. Uh, a couple of questions, Aaron. In not not at the time, but in the last 30 years, has anybody come up with a profile of the killer, any kind of an FBI or yeah, professional so profile? We talk about the second that. question, just I'll ask them both of you at once. Yep. Um, is there a reason or even a theory as to why he killed so often in 18 months and then stopped? Um, well, one of the misconceptions about serial killers is that they can't stop when, in, when in fact, many times they do, especially serial killers that go unapprehended. By the time they hit the 50s and 60s, there's yes. always a sexual element to these crimes. And as these guys' testosterone levels drop, they can lose that urge. So that you got stopped, like, like the Golden period, State guy, though. for instance. Yeah, they, they can stop. And there's a variety of, re variety of reasons why they can and do stop. Something as simple as a, a change in their personal life can cause a serial killer yeah. to stop. Like they got a new girlfriend or they met a new woman or, or, or something like that. Exactly. Guys like BTK. I mean, BTK stopped for 10 years and he got basically drawn out by the media attention. Exactly. Really. A book came out on the case and he, he had seen it and... You decided, OK, you know what? I'm going to finish my story. I'm not going to let this guy write my story. But go ahead. Aaron. No, exactly. And, and what was the first question? Um, the first question was, was, did anybody do a profile on him? Yeah. So I mentioned the FBI. Um, so they never had agents here, but the FBI was involved in this investigation in two aspects. In, in the 1980s, the FBI had the most advanced laboratories for analyzing physical evidence. Now, at this point, we're not really talking DNA because that didn't really come to the forefront until a year or two after this case. Mm -hmm. But at the time, they were doing advanced, you know, blood type analysis and hair fiber analysis and fiber analysis. So some of the physical evidence was sent to the FBI for analysis in their labs. That was the first thing that the FBI did. The second thing that the FBI did was take some of the police reports that were submitted to them by the state police here and come up with a profile of the type of person that the state police investigators here should be looking for, you know, age, race, tendencies, uh, personality, that kind of thing. So there was a profile done. I put in a freedom of information request with the FBI to get a copy of that. But of course, this is attached to an unsolved murder case. So that's protected under the exemptions. So they were they did not have to turn that over to me and they didn't. So there does there does exist a, a FBI profile for the mm -hmm. New Bedford Highway killer. Have you done a FOIA request to the feds trying to get anything or is it just always open investigation? It's really well, hard. The, the only thing to, to put in a these. FOIA for the feds with is, you know, any results they got from the testing of physical evidence or yeah. um, that profile. And I did put a put a FOIA request in for the profile and was denied uh, based on the exemption that this is an ongoing investigation. It's so tough. Why would they release that now, 30 brutal. years later? I, I don't really understand Because that. there's no statute of limitations on homicide and the right. running line from no matter who's the district attorney in Bristol County is that this is an active and open investigation. They can just, they, they could not be doing anything on this case. And I don't think they're doing much, but they could just hide behind that blanket statement and forever just prevent the general public from getting access to anything worthwhile. They can, but if they really want to solve the case at this point, it makes more sense to make that kind of a thing public. Absolutely. That's really sure. what they want to do. It makes I, I more agree sense. 100%. Frankly, it makes more sense to give guys like Aaron that sort of information than have Tom Quinn, the DA here in, in Bristol County. Are you in Bristol County, Aaron? Yeah, Bristol County, yeah. Yeah, to give Tom one Quinn, the, you know. That but, was one of the complicating factors of this case back then was the ninth body was found in Plymouth County involved the separate district attorney's office. So right. you had headbutting between the two DAs in 1989. Um, fighting over jurisdiction of that last body. And then Plymouth ended up just giving it to Bristol. So the Plymouth County District Attorney's Office was never really heavily involved in this. That's amazing. That's great. I'm imagining too, um, real quick, Aaron. 
Yep. Um, because the bodies were found in different jurisdictions, there was never a time where they might have handed it over to the FBI because you have multiple jurisdictions going at once. No, because we interviewed um, retired um, FBI profile at Mark Safarik in, in this documentary. He's right. there's like an expert witness. And what people don't realize is homicide in and of itself is not a federal crime. Yep. And course, this, right. this case never crossed state lines. So they can never prove that like some yeah. unsolved murder in Rhode Island would be connected to this. So the mm -hmm. FBI could not have just come in and taken over, but they could have assisted and they probably would have been willing to do so. Right. Um, had they had the formal request from the DA's office. And you're talking Ron Pina and then fresh off the heels of that, Paul Walsh took office oh, in 1991 sure. and he didn't yep. ask for the FBI's help either. They could Very request it now. Could request it now. 35 years yeah. after the fact. I mean, I mean yeah. is, is there still, you know, for instance, looking for someone's mentioning DNA, if they have DNA off clothing or, I mean, I don't know if they're, in 1988, they might have had the foresight, the foresight to take it off of a body sample too, right? So well, yeah, I mean, you see, you, know, yeah, you see sorry, guys like D'Angelo. D'Angelo went down for DNA, the genealogy. I mean, that's how these cases, that's the future of solving these cases. Um, the, the thing, my guess is that they do not have the DNA profile of the as yet to be identified New Bedford Highway Killer. And the, 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 the thing that I can point to for that is in 2007, um, oh, 2006, I should say, uh, Sam Sutter was elected district attorney in Bristol County. His campaign promise was that if he was going to be elected, if he were elected, he would reopen or reexamine the highway killing case. And he gets elected. And the first thing he does is, you know, reexamine the case. And the first order of business in 2007 upon his election was that they dug up the former property of Kenny Pont looking for the two bodies that were never found. Now, here's what I have to say about that. In 2000, they had Kenny Pont's DNA. He submitted hair and saliva samples back during his time as a suspect. If they had the DNA profile of the as yet to be identified killer in 2007, they very easily behind behind the scenes quietly could have either ruled Kenny Pont in or ruled Kenny Pont out based on a simple DNA analysis and not gone through the big dog and pony show of getting everybody's hopes up and digging up his property looking for these bodies. They never would have done that if they definitively knew Kenny Pont had nothing to do with it. I think it was more or less a publicity stunt. It was a. You know, mm -hmm. I'll reopen this case if I'm elected. And you know, he felt like he had to do something and digging up Kenny Pond's driver was what he did. But if yeah. they have the DNA profile of the killer, it would have had to have been something that they've come into possession of since 2007. And given the state of decomposition on these bodies and the fact that so many of them were found completely naked and had been subject to animal predation and things like that, I do not think they have the DNA profile of the killer. Right. It's interesting, too. Um, obviously, if if. There were only of the nine that were found, they were all found. None of them were buried. They were all found on the highways, right? On the edge of the highways. So it's it would be odd for him to bury the two, you know, two other. With ones. the exception of there. one. The so one of the nine, uh, Rochelle Clifford, which coincidentally is the one that they had indicted Kenny Pont in, was the mm -hmm. only one of the nine not found on a highway. She was in a gravel pit off the Reed Road exit off of Route 195 in Dartmouth, about a half a mile to a mile north of the actual highway, which is another reason why I think Kenneth Pont didn't fit the bill. I, whoever killed these women had to be somebody with an intimate knowledge of nice. that area. Yeah. And I don't think for a second that some district court attorney from New Bedford who was uh, who lived in the city, he had an office in Dartmouth, but another part of Dartmouth that was closer to the, to the ma main hub of New Bedford. I don't think he would have even known that that gravel pit existed off the Reed Road exit. It was not something that was known to people that weren't from, from the area or had some sort of an intimate knowledge with that part of, of, of Dartmouth. It's so crazy you mentioned that exit because that's the exit I used to take. I take every night to get to work from Providence to the Dartmouth House of Correction. And every time I get off that exit, I think about it. Yeah, uh, I actually live off the Reed Road exit. And We're close, my man. house We're is in the neighborhood. It's called Dartmouth Landing. My my cul-de-sac and the next one were that gravel pit where Rochelle was found. Just a coincidence. <laughs> so it, could you profile this guy? I mean, I, the only thing I can think of that we know about him is that he had a vehicle. But, uh, you know, I run, I'm not really familiar with the case. But you must have some ideas of maybe so, a way of narrowing it down a little. I think it's without a doubt somebody local i do not think that this was somebody that came in from the outside and there's a the, the most obvious reason for that is two of the victims rochelle clifford and nancy piva lived together in the same apartment in the spring of 1988 a third victim deborah DeMello's clothes were found with nancy piva's body so that that in and of itself ties three victims very very closely together 
for it to be some random John coming into the city from the outside, the odds that he would pick up two women that actually lived in the same apartment together, those odds are just not very good. Um, right. I think it was somebody that was hanging around the drug scene, somebody mm -hmm. that these women may have known casually. You know, they say serial killers don't kill people that they know, but they kill people in their environment. They may kill somebody that they recognize from the bar or from the streets, but not necessarily somebody that they know intimately. And these women may have even known this guy by on a first name basis. They, he may have been somebody that they were comfortable getting into a vehicle with. Um, so I, without a doubt, think that this was somebody local. If you look at where the bodies were dumped on these highways, they're areas where um, there would not be a lot of traffic at like two, three, four o'clock in the morning. They were dumped on straightaways uh, where you can see in, in either direction for a long period. So I, I would 100 percent think that this was a local killer. So, I mean, yeah, definitely. When you say local, you mean someone who actually lived in New Bedford. Oh, right? absolutely. Not yeah, a New, Bedford, a New Bedford resident, a New Bedford local. Yeah. And right. um, one of the misconceptions about this case is, you know, you ask people, oh, New Bedford Highway murders, and they say, oh, wasn't that all the hookers from Weld Square that were killed? And at the time, Weld Square was a part of New Bedford. It was the unofficial red light district of the city. It was an area known for prostitution and drugs. And very early on, the case developed a reputation for being tied to Weld Square. But the problem is, of the victims that they do know the last known whereabouts of, not a single one of them was seen working the streets in Wells Square. To the contrary, two of them were last seen in bars and taverns in the city of New Bedford. So I have always maintained that this case had more to do with the bars and taverns in the city and the drug scene in the bar scene than it did with actual physical prostitution on the streets. And I also believe that the number should be 15 and not 11. I believe that there were four other unsolved homicides from the city of New Bedford dating back to 1985 that are absolutely the work of the same killer. Uh, so Chandra is here and she is the daughter, I think, of one of the victims. Yeah, I know Chandra. Um, Hi, Chandra. We actually interviewed her in the uh, documentary. Chandra, so sorry for your loss and obviously not being denied the chance to have your mom all those years is just ridiculous. Um, Chandra's, <laughs> Chandra's mother was a uh, victim, uh, Deborah Perry Greenlaw DeMello, and she was found on November 8th, 1988, on the on ramp heading from the Reed Road exit in Dartmouth to New Bedford. She was actually mm -hmm. found on election day as George Bush was beating Michael Dukakis in the uh, 1988 presidential election. So, hey, sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I got tied up. I wanted to ask one question. I don't know if you asked or not, Kev. Um, I know that you think it was a local. Do you have a best guess or do you have a suspect in mind? Do you, do, um, is there somebody whose name is not out there in the ether? I, that, well, I will say, I want to be careful what I say, but I will say that I do not believe any of the four primary suspects that they had at the time were responsible for these murders. That means Kenny Pont. Tony DeGrazia, some of the lesser known suspects, guy like Neil Anderson, yep. um, who actually passed away in 2021. And there was another suspect who was very high on the police radar back then named James Baker from Tiverton, yep. Rhode Island. Um, he's there, the yeah. one that got the least amount of press, but for a while the, the police did think he was the guy. And I don't think he had anything to do with it either. I do not think it was any of those four prime suspects from back then. When we're done tonight, make sure I get your contact info. In the, sure. in the, lead, in the lead up to my book, I interviewed a gentleman twice who had been at the Bridgewater Treatment Center who was a serial uh, rapist of women uh, from Westport. And um, I didn't like him for any of my cases, but I absolutely... What year was this? Did you do this? Um, book came out two years ago. I started it in 17, um, 16. So I had found this man. He was a known associate of a, um, of, um, a man that I had been studying for years. Um, and I found him on a log of, a, of the treatment center in Bridgewater. This man had been arrested for um, every year that he was out of prison, he had been arrested for raping women. And a lot of the times, you know, it was in these, they, they were prostitutes. He, they were certain young women in state parks in Westport, Freetown, New Bedford. And his name has flown totally under the radar for years. I had talked to Maureen Boyle about this guy. I was so, I had interviewed him twice. Uh, he lived in Attleboro. Um, I was so, I, I fell down a long rabbit hole with this guy and he had nothing to do with my case, but I liked him so much for the, for the, uh, New Bedford highway killings because he was there at that time and he had so many rape convictions under his belt and 
he was of the time period and he, he it's just a, a guy whose name has probably never been reported anywhere, but my book and this show. And uh, I'd like to run it by you. Okay, sure. Yeah, we can talk after. Absolutely. Um, Chandra is commenting here saying that she thinks the killer came from Bridgewater mm. State Hospital. And me and Dave have talked about it many times. Well, Chandra, at Monster University. Please reach out uh, to me because unfortunately, I don't think there's a person in Massachusetts who's more of an expert of men and women who have been through Bridgewater, especially the sex offenders. Um just to, to piggyback on that, um, there was at the treatment center at the time a furlough program, and I think that's what Chandra's referring to, where they were yes. actually letting prisoners out, or inmates out, and they would go stay in an apartment somewhere and then report back on the weekend. So they'd go out during the week to work, stay in an apartment, and then be required to report back to the treatment center on weekends. Yes. And some of those guys were being put up in New Bedford at the time. And it's a good theory. Um, there is another individual who does research on this case who takes that theory a little bit to a level where I don't necessarily agree. Mm -hmm. Um, but in and of itself, the, the theory that these, ki the killer could have been somebody from the treatment center who was on furlough in New Bedford is a, is a very viable, viable theory. Um, mm -hmm. I just don't agree to the level that he takes it. Yeah. There was a guy. So named I think, I'm, 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 I'm just curious. I mean, if I don't think I want to give you a chance too, to Aaron, to answer um, Dave's question, Aaron, I don't think we got back to, if you had any suspects to, and I know it seemed like maybe you were uncomfortable. And to name yeah, I don't, I, 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 I don't, don't really want to go there in this forum, unfortunately, in terms of, yeah. uh, I, but I, like I said, I will say that I do not think it was any of the four prime suspects from that time period. I, I, I don't. Right. I, um, no, I think we're, we're certainly not asking for names. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just asking. No, we're not. You know, for example, you could say, all right, this guy had to have had a car. He's dropping all the bodies. On. He, so, oh, yeah, so if he local had a, guy so with if, access if he had to a car. car he, yep. he probably had a job. Back then, it, certainly, and I mean, unless he inherited money, he probably had a job. So, and so he lives in New Bedford. He has a job. He hangs around the bars. Into um, drugs. Or into he's, the he's drugs. Probably scene. into drugs. Into somebody who very possibly could have been friendly with Kenneth Pont. Um, there's another individual in this case that I feel is the most important living witness in the New Bedford Highway murders case. And that is the boyfriend of Nancy Piva, a guy named Frankie Pina. No relation to District Attorney Ron Pina, not, not related at all. Um, but Frankie Pina lived in the same apartment unit with Nancy Piva and Rochelle Clifford before they were both killed. Frankie Pina was the last person that Rochelle Clifford was seen alive with on April 27th when she was approached by Detective Dextra to testify in that assault case involving Kenneth Pont. So she was with Frankie Pina in that moment. They were walking together on the street. Two months, uh, three months later, when Nancy Piva, Frankie's girlfriend, goes missing on July 7th, she walks out of a bar in the South End called Whispers Pub. She's last seen walking up County Street. And somebody offered her a ride. She declined. That is the last time she was seen alive. And Frankie was in the bar with her that night. They had had some sort of disagreement. And Nancy went storming out of the place. So now you have a guy who lived with two of these victims and was the last person that each of them was with before they disappeared. But Frankie, later in the summer, goes to jail on an unrelated assault charge. And he's incarcerated when at least one, if not two, of the other victims disappear. So I do not think that Frankie was involved knowingly in these murders, but I absolutely think that the killer would have to be somebody that was hanging around Frankie and that Frankie likely knew. Um, it just it, for him to be so closely tied to two women and be with them shortly before they disappear suggests that Frankie deserved a closer look, much like Kenneth Font, as an important witness in the case. And I know Detective Dextrader, who unfortunately had to leave the department as the case was heating up on a medical and never came back yeah when the yeah. case was first starting he was in contact with frankie because oddly enough frankie is the one who reported nancy missing two days after she goes missing so dextrator was kind of suspicious of frankie because he realizes okay i i saw this guy with a woman who i haven't been able to track down for this for testifying in this case and now he's reporting his own girlfriend missing this guy's suspicious and you can see why he would have thought that um, so he kept in contact with Frankie when Frankie was in jail, leading Frankie to believe that, you know, I'm actively involving investigating Nancy's case, which Dextrator was. But he also was suspicious of Frankie. And I don't even think Frankie realized that. But once Dextrator took his leave, it can't, uh, Frankie Pino wasn't really spoken to much after that point in time. He did testify to the special grand jury that they had impaneled during that time to investigate the case. 
But by that point, the special grand jury was honing in on Kenneth Font. He, Kenneth Font was indicted only days after Frankie Pina testified. So, you know, at that point, the only thing they're asking Frankie about is Kenny Pont. They're not asking about anything else. And that was the last time Frankie was really spoken to about this case. And the guy's still alive. And I think he should be spoken to again. Oh, I am not hearing you guys. Sorry oh, about that. Okay. Buddy. Yeah, okay um, yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry, I was fixing don't my have phone. To, don't have to give me a name. And, and again, I've, I've written a lot about true crime. I wrote a whole book on true crime. I know it's very important not to name people. Um, but do you have somebody in mind that you go, fuck, I wish I could nail this guy. But in my heart, the evidence, my intuition tells me it's it could be this guy. Um. I, I can't answer that here. I'm sorry, guys. I can't I can't okay. answer that. I'll, I'll say no. <laughs> okay. I can't answer that right now. Well, you guys can take what, from that what you will. Can do how about this, Aaron? You you're you're are you done filming the documentary? So we have six of the seven episodes done. Um mm -hmm. we're trying to finish the seventh, and we would need a partner to bring this to the forefront. Um there's some issues with um licensing that we need assistance in funding the licensing of some of the archival material that we want to use and we need to make sure that we're protected legally for any legal pitfalls that might come along the way so mm -hmm. it's we're we're actively searching for a partner we've had people approach us we are in talks with a couple different entities right now so you know mm -hmm. it's been a long time and i understand people are probably frustrated and this is like the watch pot that never boils um but it's been an unhealthy obsession of mine for eight years and we will see this to the finish line. It's just a matter of finding the right partner. And it's a big part of it is not wanting to lose. You know, we, we know there's no such thing as complete control, but a lot of these people want us to sign on the dotted line, which we would just lose complete creative control yep. of this project. Yep. And we've taken it too far to watch that happen. Yeah, I, I run into that in my own life. Trust me, it's 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 just impossible nowadays to navigate the system and get something down done in a timely fashion. Um, where can we find you on socials? If people want to help fund this thing, if people want to follow you, what you're doing. Yeah, I'm on Facebook as Aaron Cadu. Uh, I think I'm one of only two in the world. I think there's another one in Canada. Um, but the high, the uh, project has a website, highwaymurders.com. People can leave information there. First of all, I'm going to preface this. If you have relevant information, take it to the police, but then bring it to us. Um, so we have the website, highwaymurders.com. Uh, you can... Uh, leave information there. We have a hotline that you can call anonymously and leave information there. So there's ways to get in touch with us. Um, my email for the project is Aaron. Uh, actually, my email for my company is Aaron at BristolCountyMedia.com. That's the best, probably the best way to, to reach me. Let me play this trailer. I forgot to play it, Aaron. So let me do the trailer yeah, from your right. documentary. Absolutely. This is really good work. And then we'll talk we about that. Look at this, guys. It is awesome. Fourth of July weekend. My pager went off, called the station, made a phone call, found out that like the police wanted my assistance and I drove up to the scene. I met with a female who apparently had gone into the woods to make a rest stop and came across the skeletal remains of a female. Saturday, July 30th. The remains of a body were found in a wooded area off Route 195 in Dartmouth. The second victim that we've identified is a woman named Nancy Piper. As soon as the second body was found, right away, I said, I think we have a serial killer on our hands. No arrests have been made. The families of victims have suffered most. She was one that always wanted to do good to herself. She really was a good, caring person. I was always hoping that she was alive. All those bodies started popping up on the highway, and my Uncle Wayne thought to himself, that sounds like Debbie. Well, we're on a normal river patrol, and one of the workers would come and got me, and you know, it was a human skull. Six specially trained police dogs will be searching Search selected, selected secondary selected roads and highways throughout the area. The DA says police are now looking at a number of possible suspects who are known to frequent or travel through the Weld Square area. New complaint is issued against Neil Anderson for assault with intent. Former New Bedford attorney Kenny Pont appeared in New Bedford Superior Court charged with beating and killing Rochelle Clifford de Pirla. I demand that your harassment has me to stop immediately. Do I agree with the way you know, handled the case? No, I don't. There's a nice day now. now. Of one of one children. Now it's 27 years we're at. My grandmother went to her grave without ever knowing 
what happened to her daughter. All right, that's really good work. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's see what was that under that stage. Aaron, that's that's awesome, man. That is just oh, thank you, work, man. Thank you. That, um, what do you do? I mean, is this your full time thing or yeah? How so, much of your time do you dedicate to this? So, like, what's your back? Whatever spare you? time I have. So, I do video production for a living. I own and operate a company called Bristol County Media. So, I do a lot of television commercials, corporate videos, any kind of video production related work. That's how I make a living. So, these kind of things, like the Bridgewater Triangle, the Highway Murders, these are like pet projects that I take on on the side. Um, with the hopes that they, they'll, you know, see success someday. And um, this one is by far the most amount of work I've ever put into anything in my life. Uh, it's like I said before, it's been an unhealthy obsession. And, um, you know, I just, we want to see this through. It's just, um, this case is a hornet's nest. Um, I don't think that there was any sort of like conspiracy really per se. I think there were absolutely huge mistakes made in the investigation, largely due to the fact that the police here were just in over their heads. And I think that those mistakes were costly and and may have been enough to, to ruin any chance that this is actually ever solved. Um, I was saying to Kevin earlier, um, there one important thing that I think people need to pay attention to is there were four other unsolved homicides in the city of New Bedford with strong similarities to the highway murders dating back to 1985. And the only difference in those cases was that the bodies were not found along highways. But you had a murder in 1985, a woman, a woman named Shirley Parton, who was last seen in a New Bedford bar. She was found beaten, strangled and raped, shoved underneath an electrical generator along the waterfront in New Bedford. A year later, another woman named Dorothy Danielson, 19 years old, uh, 20 years old, I'm sorry, found beaten, strangled and raped only 600 feet from where Shirley Parton was found a year before. Last seen in a bar, just like Shirley Parton. A year after that, in 1987, another woman named Joanne Andrade, last seen in a bar, found strangled and thrown in the water with a fishing boat's dock only a half mile down the road from where Shirley Parton and Dorothy Danielson had been found the two previous years. Six months after Joanne Andrade was murdered, the New Bedford Highway murders begin with women disappearing from the streets. So I believe that in 1987, the state police and the New Bedford police should have realized that they were dealing with a serial killer. In a city of this size, I, and John Dextrader, who was the, the first detective to really notice a trend in missing women from New Bedford and sound the alarms about a possible serial killer. He was the lead New Bedford detective on the Parton case in 85 and the Danielson case in 86. And he thought that those murders were connected, as did the state police investigators that worked those cases. So now you have the possibility of a guy who's single handedly responsible for two murders, one in 85 and one in 86. Then you have this other one in 87 a year later, a half mile down the road for there to be multiple serial killers of that nature in a city of the size of New Bedford in a three year time span with nothing like this happening before 1985 and nothing like this happening after 1988. The odds just don't favor it. Any serial killer profiler from the FBI would look at those statistics and tell you that it's almost a certainty that those other victims are victims of the same killer. And as a matter of fact, the New Bedford Highway murders, now I mentioned three, there's a fourth one here that's very interesting. There was a woman named Dawn Copeland who was found bludgeoned and shoved underneath a jetty on the beach in Dartmouth, and this was in June, late June of 1988. Now, if you look at the timeline of this thing, which is I, something that's always overlooked is the timeline. Don Copeland was last seen in a bar, just like those other three victims that I just talked about, and just like two of the highway murder victims. Nancy Pive, a highway murder victim, last seen in a bar, July 7th, 1988. Two weeks later, uh, a week later, uh, Mary Rose Santos, last seen in a bar, victim of the highway killer, uh, victim of the highway killer, last seen in a bar, July 16th, 1988. A couple weeks before that, you had Don Copeland last seen in a bar, found bludgeoned and shoved underneath a jetty in that same stretch of time. So you had like three victims over a period of three weeks last seen in bars. But the problem was when Don Copeland's body was found at the end of June of 1988, police at that point were still completely unaware that there was a serial killer because the first highway murder victim's body was not found in Freetown until a week later. And even at that point, they didn't realize they were dealing with a serial killer. They didn't realize they were dealing with a serial killer until you get to the third body in November of 1988. And nobody looked back to realize that Don Copeland 
literally disappeared in the middle of this. Middle of it. In the middle of it. it, it and it was a last scene at a bar. And one of the bars that she was in the night that she disappeared was the same bar that Nancy Piver would go missing like a week and a half later. It, it just statistically, it's it's almost impossible awesome. for these other cases not to be the same killer, especially in a city. This I know I beat that drum in every interview that I'm in, but I think the number should have at least be at least 15 and not 11. I think that this guy, whoever this was, is the most prolific serial killer in New England and Massachusetts history, surpassing the Boston Strangler. And he's never been found, and he could still be out there right now. We don't know. Yeah, that's, that's a very strong possibility. Thing. Yes, very absolutely. Very strong possibility yeah. that he just got older, something changed in his life. Like you said earlier, great point, incredible point. One that's very often overlooked is that these guys do stop. That's a major misconception. Um, Aaron, I got nothing else. Uh, highway murder. Uh, yeah, I got a, I got a couple of things. No, I absolutely sure. do. I I, I um, reported this in my original series on Lizzie Borden a, a couple of years ago. That yes, they, that's a misconception. They do absolutely stop, but it's a little unusual for this guy to start so quick and kill 11 people or possibly some earlier as she's saying and then stop on a dime like that usually there's you know to kill in such a short burst and then stop it i'm not saying it you know it's, i'm not saying he died or anything he could have been in jail um and he could have lost the opportunity like you said if he if he if he um his job changed or or um or, or he ended up with a girlfriend or something like that there are all kinds of reasons but it is a little bit unique it is or odd. Interesting but i don't think he started and i don't think he started in april 1980 i think the likelihood that something see the, the thing about serial killers is they don't have motives but they can have trigger events something yes. innocuous can happen in their personal life that causes them to act out and That's i think right. something likely if the same killer was responsible for the other four or the other three leading into the highway murders something major might have happened in his personal life that caused him to basically kill if you include don copeland would have killed 12 women over a four and a half month time period now would you speculate that in the earlier killings he didn't have a car since he wasn't dropping them off the highway I think he probably had a car because uh, with the Don Copeland case, if you include hers, there were tire tracks on the beach where she was found okay. but to indicate okay. that she was dumped from a vehicle. Okay. Yeah. And was she, where did she come in? I forget in the progression, but was she the first before the official killings? No, or? no, she would have been. So she was, there were already at least five or six women that were dead by the time Don Copeland was killed. They just didn't know it yet. Mm -hmm. So the women mm -hmm. started disappearing in April. They didn't realize what was happening until the end of the summer. But Don Copeland, if you look back at it, was literally right. killed in the middle. And those other four cases, Parton, Danielson, Andrade, Copeland, they were probed and mentioned alongside the highway murders as possibly being connected, but they were never officially connected to the highway murders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, are there any other true crime cases you follow or any other serial killers or anything you're investigating? Um, not at the moment. This one's just kind of absorbed my existence for the last uh, eight years. I, I've, I've learned a lot, done a lot of research. I can, it sounds like... Uh, boasting to say this um um it, outside of maureen boyle who wrote shallow graves in 2017 she was the first reporter to start covering the case and covered the case front to back for the new Bedford standard times outside of maureen boyle there's not a person on this planet that knows more about the highway murders case than i do and that's Aaron, like I'm, I'm a boasting jerk for saying that but outside of maureen boyle you will not find somebody that knows the case better Right. Aaron, me and you are kindred spirits, man. You have no idea. Um, I'll catch up with you after the show. Catch, catch up with me after the show, pal. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see it, bro. Oh, thank I, you I very really, much. Thanks, guys. Anybody who's interested in Aaron's it's been work. A having you. Thank you. No, it's been great. And I, I tend to motor mouth about this. So thanks for putting up with my crap. Totally fine. We <laughs> That's love all right. It. Well, we'll we'd be happy to have you back. And maybe we maybe we'll even do something on the New Bedford Triangle. Or no, the Bridgewater Triangle. The Bridgewater <laughs> Triangle. Yeah. I'm a major skeptic when it comes to that. I did the documentary, but I am a major skeptic. But um I, I'm willing to talk about that too. I, I'm Thank totally you, a skeptic, but at the same time, I find it fun. I love a good story. It is, so it is a lot it's a lot more fun and a lot lighter than this. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we'll definitely do it. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, thanks guys. Aaron. Thank Take you, Aaron. Too. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye. All right, guys. That's Aaron. That was awesome. I love I loved this case. I love the New Bedford Highway killing case. It's so interesting. Um, it's just, you know, the worst serial killer in the history of this in the history of this area and still unsolved. Still unsolved. There's another one up in that's that's even less known up in Claremont, New Hampshire. But we'll do that one someday. That's yeah, uh, know it well. That's a big yes, one too that went on over the period, mm -hmm. period of years. Um, so I wanted to just give you some good news, Dave, and everybody else that I got while I was sitting here. 
um, that I made the quarterfinals for a screenplay competition. The only one I do and the only one that matters because it's put on by the Oscars people. And the reason it's good news for us, Dave, is because the screenplay actually was inspired by Have You Seen Andy? So I wrote it when I had COVID. And uh, it's kind of a crazy story, but it, it's so – this is before I knew you. But if you read this screenplay, you'd be like, oh, my God, this is like it, – it had all your theories in it. Even even the part about the uh, – using the incinerator with Wayne Chapman and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I was, it's just it's, – it's, you'd be like, wow, I, it, you'd think you wrote it. It was which, But it was before I even knew about your book. But the nice thing about it is, is when you make the quarterfinals in this – really elite competition it's really hard to make it i made it once before about 10 years ago you get contacted by a couple of dozen or more agencies and studios that want to see your work so what i'm going to do in this case here when that starts to happen is pitch our documentary series so hopefully we'll be able to get some funding and then we won't have to ask anybody for help <laughs> oh dave is muted uh my apologies, guys. I lost you for a minute there. I lost everything. Um, Kevin, okay. you're wildly talented, bro. It doesn't surprise me. You're the best writer I know, and I, I'm not going to boast, I'm, but I think I'm pretty good, pretty decent writer getting there, but you're the best writer I know, man. So um, All right, really, so I mean that. I want to get to this. Um, I want I, Me and Dave are going to go over this video. This is just um, it's kind of crazy. I want to talk about it for a couple minutes, though. So I was talking to someone from Canton the other day who knows all the players, same age. Wow. He brought up interesting points about Deputy Chief Kelleher, who lives across the street from the Alberts, or where they used to live, right from the right where John was found dead. He wanted he wanted to know why Kelleher, the Deputy Chief, never came out of the house that morning. And I think it's a good question. Now maybe he did, and there were just no reports of it. But how extraordinarily strange if he didn't come out? It's just as strange as the Alberts not coming out. A man dies violently across the street from your house, and you're the Deputy Chief. You don't supervise that investigation. You aren't out there overseeing things. Do these guys just duck into a rabbit hole whenever something involves a cop, even suspicious deaths? And consider this. Don't the Canton police want to make sure everything in their work looks perfect when it's right outside the home of the boss? Doesn't everyone in any line of work make sure they do the job right when the boss is watching? Then why wasn't this crime scene secured? Where's the yellow tape? Why did they leave the scene unattended for many hours while waiting for the state police? I think like 10 hours or something like that. Um, don't you leave a cruiser out there with the lights on all day waiting for the state police? I mean, this is a violent, suspicious death scene. There's an image of a man later just walking through. And the street was presumably plowed again and again as it snowed all day. They just left that all like that right in front of the boss. Is that how they secure a crime scene right in front of the boss? Really? So the guy I talked to also believes... Kelleher, who he knows, would absolutely have been at the party the night before. He's not saying he was there when Karen dropped John off, but Kelleher is known to party. The guy mentioned several cops by name who live within a block or two. He believes they all would have been partying at that place that night. People ask me all the time whenever I report something on one side or the other of this case if I'm switching sides. I'm on no side. So here's one from the other side. Why did Karen's father mention in the interview on 2020 that Karen said in the hospital that she might have backed into something? Did you guys notice that? You have to understand, Karen's lawyers would have prepared her parents for days, maybe even weeks for that interview. Every syllable would have been practiced beforehand. There were no slips of the tongue. So why did they deliberately inject that into the conversation? You know the likely answer. You just might not like it. If her attorneys know that she did it, then they know that there's eventually going to be powerful evidence that comes out. For example, the black box or something else. Then the goal becomes to show she didn't know that she hit him. So they're planting that seed by saying she wasn't sure. See what I mean? Welcome to the fence, right? The view's nice up here, if a bit uncomfortable. To be fair, I see very strange things in this case that indicate both Reed was guilty and that she's innocent. As I've said, as far as I'm concerned, maybe John's sitting in a bar somewhere in Mexico laughing his ass off because nothing makes sense here. It seems like he was both killed by Karen Reed and inside the house. But at least one of those things, at least one, didn't happen. Now, I want to analyze this video on the channel called Surviving the Survivor. 
look, I confess to having a weakness. It's my biggest flaw, and it gets me into trouble all the time. It's this. I can't stand stupidity. Not that anyone likes stupidity, but it really makes my blood boil. It's a weakness. Now, you guys know how torn I am in the Karen Reed case, so I want strong arguments from both sides. But this Wendy Murphy makes me ashamed to be a Murphy, which I am on my grandmother's side. All I want is both sides of the case with intelligent arguments. The court TV thing last week was a joke. Turtle in the defense did a good job, but it was one-sided. Here, no one did a good job. Are these the minds on which the fate of the Republic stands? So let's play the clip, Dave. Sorry to torture you with this, but Murphy's legal mind doesn't pass the bar exam. <laughs> Not the bar I know. Well, one thing we can agree on is that Wendy, oh. Wendy Murphy knows nothing. So we'll agree on that. Oh, this is so bad. It's like, I guess this is kind of going to be the, uh, the light heart part of the moment. So let's play the screen. And here we go. Defense is saying, and we've got some of the best guests on this, Wendy Murphy uh, in the red. She serves as adjunct professor of sexual violence law at New England Law Boston, where she also co-directs the Women's and Children's Advocacy Project under the Center for Law and Social Responsibility. She is a former visiting scholar at Harvard Law School. You probably heard of then you've got, then you've got uh, uh, Tom Simon. Tom Simon. Uh, he's, uh, he's served the served FBI, FBI for 26 for years as a special, as a special agent, agent with an expertise with an in white collar crime investigations and sensitive national security, security matters. matters. He's also, he's a, also CPA, a CPA, which is interesting, interesting an accountant, account. a forensic accountant, and a licensed private investigator, private investigator based, based out of Jacksonville, Jacksonville Florida. Florida. His, His company, company is Simon, Simon Worldwide, Worldwide Investigations. investigations. Uh, he works uh, discrete uh, investigations, investigations, including corporate, corporate embezzlement. I might have to put him on the payroll, payroll, make sure my wife's my not uh, spending uh, in any kind of crazy manner. Um, Lara Uretz, uh, certainly, certainly uh, last, uh, last but not least, she is the principal of Uretzian Law, a uh, Michael Jackson, Michael? Jackson uh, hip hop artist, Nate Dogg. Nate Dogg. Uh, you can also find us at, uh, one last quick last thing. Quick thing. case. John Brian Albert. Uh, three days later, days later a, woman, a woman, the California based attorney, where Karen. And that that is why he died. Um, but, but I don't think I there's don't any evidence at all, at all that she that wanted she to, kill, to him, kill him, even though they did have trouble in her relationship. The, the bottom the line for me is, is what does the evidence the show? Evidence. And the most compelling most evidence by far, by far is, is her own state I mean, we're talking about things she said, not only to multiple, multiple witnesses, witnesses. Um, and, and I mean multiple, multiple witnesses, witnesses, right after right this happened, but also what she said to police, and what she said to police that is, you know, indisputed. I mean, unless you're going to say that every witness, not just the police, but all the witnesses she spoke to are all lying about the fact that she said she dropped him off. She did a three point turn. And then when he didn't come home, she said, and, and you know, when she realized the next morning that maybe something happened, she said, oh, my God, I hit him to multiple people. I mean, even even her own father recently said on television that she said to him, so he's going to be part of the conspiracy too, if this is all a big lie. She said to him, I think I hit something. Now, whether she said to him, I think I hit him or I think I hit something, the point is she was wasted. She was bombed. She drove him to the party. He got out. He was carrying a glass in his hand, a drink he had taken from the bar where they had all been drinking. O'Keefe was drunk too. He gets out of the car. There's a bit of confusing information about whether she dropped him, you know, at the at the driveway side of the house or on the far end of the house. It doesn't matter because the bottom line is he gets out. He apparently falls on his ass because he's drunk. And when she does her three point turn, which she says she did, let's take her at her word. She's the one who said she did a three point turn. If she backs into him, and oh by the way, she ends up with a broken tail light which she didn't have before she hit him, uh, pieces of her tail light are found at the scene where his dead body is. Um, and there's no real explanation for how those pieces of her tail light got at the scene right near where his body was found. If she backs up and hits him because, and she can't see him because he fell on his ass before she knocked him over, which would make sense. That's where his injury is right above his right eye. He gets slammed back. 
and 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 fractures his skull, which is how he ends up dying. Apparently, there's some hypothetical. Can we cut it right there real quick? Yeah, sorry. I was trying to mute the mic too and do it. So, um, God, my ears are bleeding. Guys, sorry about the feedback. But yeah, go ahead, Dave. First of all, I have history with Wendy. Um, I wrote a book on a man named Wayne Chapman. Obviously, you guys know that by now. Wayne Chapman, uh, one of his uh, victims, his attorney is Wendy Murphy. So she does a lot of speaking tours and, and talks a lot about the case, the case that much like Aaron, I've been unhealthily obsessed with for seven years. Um, she goes on a lot of speaking gigs just like this, talking about that case and gets all the facts wrong every time. So we have to start from the, from the default setting, which is this lady knows nothing, which is obviously the case in this. And before that, we didn't catch it, but just before you, when you stopped it, she she said you know that she made a statement that is insane she said that um there's no doubt in really anybody's mind and i'm quoting that karen reed did this and um i don't know how you could make that statement obviously there's so much doubt your dog bites um you know she's uh, trying to know, basically say there's no doubt in anybody smart's mind or something like that right, but i mean right. and then she goes on to explain that it's obvious to her that he sat down, he fell on his ass after yeah. he got out of the car. Karen backed into him in the back of the head, presumably, mm -hmm. and then he fell in the back of his head, and that's how he got the injuries. It's so absurd, it's almost, it's laughable. It's like, I don't even know what she, is that what she thinks, or does she think he fell down and she backed over his legs and hit him in the face with her car yeah. and knocked him onto the back of his head and managed to leave no bruises on the face? Yeah, I, I don't even know what she thinks. It's just crazy. Don't, you don't know what she thinks because she can't tell you a coherent story or give you a coherent theory. And she also goes on. We're not going to kill you guys with this because I can't. I can't even with this lady. It's late. I haven't eaten yet. I'm about to get hangry in a minute here. Um, she also talks a lot about the Google search, which we have disagreed on in the past. Whatever. Forget about that. Let's let's go against a common enemy for once. She actually talks more about the health app data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Explain the health app data because I didn't get that far yet. I, ex explain how she gets into that because that's really interesting about her comments on the health app data, which are just, I mean, it's just, it only exists in her mind. It's completely delusional on, on the health app data. Um, and also she talks a lot. Too, because he then gets buried by a blizzard. Mm -hmm. But the fact is his head gets slammed down. He gets a fractured skull in the back. And everybody knows, I mean, this is not unusual knowledge. I was a prosecutor for many years. I worked with her lawyer, Unetti. We worked in the same office. Um, we all know that if, if someone gets a bad head injury, they're going to end up with bilateral uh, black eyes. It's a common response to bleeding from head trauma. Um, and those are his injuries. And so Wendy, what, what, what do you think? He, for how what do you think? Light ends up with his body. So why they came up, why the defense came up with this cockamamie theory about <laughs> the conspiracy among the cops because mean, they yeah. actually beat him up. It's so nonsensical. Oh, but it's and she just froze up there. Hurting. Even yeah, um, it's hurting the defense credibility. I think Yanetti is a great lawyer. I think he's destroying his credibility. You think? And I think we all need to admit something. And then and then I'll re and then I'll shut up. We have to understand something. Do. Defense attorneys can and do pay money to PR firms or bloggers or whatever to put nonsense into the court of public opinion and to whip the public into a frenzy. And I'm sorry to say this, but today the public is only too happy to believe that cops are bad, they're doing bad things. And so it sticks. It sticks right, can you even stop it there? there's no rational mm. basis for it. But let's understand okay. that. Okay, let's, let's stop there. Obviously she's insinuating that the defense found, instead of going to Fox News or whomever, although I trust Turtle Boy, I had all of them anyway. Um, she's insinuating that the defense went to Turtle Boy, you know, wrote him a check and said, this is the information that you're going to put out into the ether. Um, and she's also, she's almost insinuating that like it's a common thing that's known in the law community that, hey, this is what happens. You know, we, they pay money to bloggers to put, you know, radical conspiracy theories out into the ether, which is, I mean, that's a wild accusation to make, Kevin. 
on, on, a, on it a, doesn't even really matter to me because I just want to look at the evidence. I don't really, you know, I'm grateful that Turtle Boy has given us a lot of evidence, but I look at it independently. And uh, I, so, I, you know, why should we let any blogger or any news source, don't let them make up your mind for you. Analyze the evidence yourself. And we've all analyzed this evidence and we all have a variety of opinions on it. And that's all, we're all big people. We all know how to make that decision. Right. We're not being, you know, I don't think, most of us are being told what to think by Turtle Boy. He's making an argument, and he, either it convinces you or it doesn't. Hey, here's the facts. You know, facts are, you know, he has a dog bite. Dog disappears. We have a home that's in the family for a generation. They sell it for 50K cheaper than the market price. They all run into hiding. They, they, they don't defend themselves in public. If me and you were being accused of murder and we were guilty, uh, not guilty, I'd be on Fox News every night. I'd be talking to Tucker Carlson. I'd be on Fox 25. I'd do Turtle Boy's show. Everything. I mean, there, I, I wouldn't run away from it. I mean, all of the normal things that an innocent person would do is not being done right now. And that's bizarre. And that does not even gone into here. The um, Google search and you know, how long to die in cold. She, she makes moronic points about that. Like, oh, we all know that's nonsense. Uh, no, we don't, Wendy. We don't know that's nonsense. In, in it's fact, a dispute. It's, I mean, there are experts very on much, both sides. You know, it's, I mean, it's very much in dispute. Um, um, we're, we're didn't even, not even getting into the, I mean, not once in this show did they mention that there's a grand jury. Not once did they say, oh, by the way, these people have been subpoenaed by a grand jury to discuss this case. Not once does that come up, Wendy. Don't you think that's an important point? All right. So I want to, I want to play it on a little bit. If, you, if you'll play along with me, Dave, because she talks about the health app data and this kind of bothers yeah. me too. Yeah. And I think it can be explained how she ends up in this very erroneous position, but it's also reviewing. This lady, this lady this drives me nuts. I mean, she does. Go ahead. It's a tactic that the defense uses in some cases. Spend money on PR, get the media to whip the public into a frenzy about nonsense, and hope that it translates into something advantageous for your client. The conspiracy theory that the cops are all in this and they killed him after she left. Stop. Bullshit. Stop. Stop, Kevin. Stop real quick. Again, a, a, a conspiracy theory that the, all these people, it doesn't take that many people to get together for this, by the way. It's not like this big grand fucking thing. And by the way, by all accounts from everyone who, who talks on background, they're already ratting on each other. They're not making Facebook posts, but they're behind the scenes ratting on each other right now, just so you guys know, okay? And as far as conspiracy theories go, again, you know, go ask the Tuskegee guys, you know, uh, about conspiracy theories, 50,000 black men being inje injected with syphilis. Go ask the Johns um, during Operation Mockingbird and, and Paperclip when they were spraying them with LSD to, to uh, find a new truth serum, truth serum, all right, when the CIA was trying to find truth serum, and they'd lure men in under the guise of sex, and then they'd spray things on them. All right, it just never ends the amount of things that we've done. So don't give me the bullshit that it's not possible because these people could never get together on a case like that. Stop. It doesn't take that many people. Sorry. I mean, the more people that it requires to be involved in it, the higher the mountain you have to get over to prove that there might be a conspiracy. But in this case, there are there is quite a bit of strange evidence. There's a lot of strange evidence. And the bottom line is you, it's really difficult. I, for some reason, Wendy Murphy thinks it's easy to explain those injuries. And I have never heard a sensible explanation as to how those injuries happen. Maybe there is one, and maybe we'll, we'll hear this at the trial. What Wendy Murphy said is completely nonsensible. So, I mean, somehow he's he, he's sitting on the ground, he gets hit in the back of the head, and then he falls in the back of his head and ends up 12 feet on the lawn lying on top of his phone. None of right. that makes sense. None of that makes sense. I mean, that, it's, it's just that doesn't, theory doesn't. is so incoherent that she could almost be Jen McCabe's lawyer. I could actually see her taking over for Reddington. She needs to work on this case. If I was Jen, I'd fire him. I mean, I you know, I think I could do a better job defending defending her than that. I mean, that's just oh. absurd. I don't. Who is the who is the I, fifth I guest on this show? <laughs> who is the fifth guest? Pants a crust. I'm I'm almost expecting pants a crust to come on. And we, we probably won't get this far in the video, but when they go to the one person who's who's on the defense side, she's, Murphy's constantly rolling her eyes and this and that. It's like, yeah. dude, be respectful, you be know? Respectful. I mean, all right. So let's. Well, um, she's smart. She's a learned lawyer, Kevin. She's a lot smarter than you. She went to Harvard. Wendy, Wendy. Uh, tell us how you really feel. The Boston Passion. Real quick, Wendy, uh, what should she have been charged with? Manslaughter. Manslaughter at best. At best. Okay. If you don't want someone to die, if you're not intending that they die, 
But to do something reckless, like you're too drunk to look out your rear view mirror carefully and make sure no one's behind you before you do a three point turn, that's manslaughter. And that's what she should have been charged with. And if he were not a cop, that's what she would have been charged with. And she never and there, once there mentions. There were some interesting having, Google searches from the like, uh, someone connected to uh, the police officer whose house, uh, the person who was having this party. We're going to get to that, um, which is a defensive case. Uh, that's we'll get also into nonsense, but we'll get to it. We'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll, to get it. we'll get into the weeds on that. Uh, Tom Simon, uh, we're looking at a photo right now of Karen Reed and uh, her now late boyfriend, John O'Keefe, a Boston a guy named Alan Jackson, who in fact, there never saw a body at 2:30. He's showing him, saying they were out drinking, but uh, zero. The only really important thing to remember here is that everything that was done and said up to you know the first three days after this happened is is sort of it was it, everybody was in agreement that she hit him. Even she was in agreement. She hit him. It was by accident, um, and she was devastated. It, the, things only went south after they started talking about charging her, her with murder because they weren't they weren't getting along in their relationship. And I think when you overcharge someone, you get an over defense in the other direction. I want to say something about this unbelievably silly idea that he had somehow gone into the house. All the witnesses just lied about that, right? All of them, and they weren't all cops, by the way, but they all just and they weren't even all adults or they were young adults, family members all lied and said, we never saw him come in. That makes no sense. But here's the thing about that iPhone data, the very data and the very technology the defense says proves that he was walking around 80 some odd steps shows that that data was, was um, created hours after he died. Like, like he supposedly took 64 steps at 1030 in the morning. He was already dead and in the hospital. I mean, this is so, this is why it's so nutty to even say this out loud. When a jury finds out that the defense has been making up nonsense stories in the court of public opinion to try. Wild, huh? And uh, I guess she that's enough for world, Wendy. She never once says why she was overcharged too. Like as a lawyer, like, oh, I wonder why they overcharged her. Uh, I don't know, Wendy. They were trying to bully her into a deal and hope that the public didn't find out and they give her manslaughter, get her some probation, maybe a couple years in jail. The Alberts. Well, I think there could be other reasons, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll save that for another day. But we haven't um, even gotten into Wendy and the Duke lacrosse case, which she should have been disbarred over. This woman shouldn't even but be. It, uh, it's know. just it, it's, she's trying to. Say, so, oh, so Lally made in the June mo and the June hearing, he made this crazy argument. He was not trying to suggest that the health app data that the defense was reading when they said he took those whatever it was 70, uh, 700 steps or something like that, and the three mm -hmm. flights of stairs. I forget the numbers. Yeah, he was. The, what Lally was trying to do. He made this point that that data is unreliable based on the fact that the health app also also showed him moving around after he was pronounced dead, which was absurd because obviously it was that was the cops picking up his phone and moving around with it. But Ladley did not say that that data did not show that he moved around. He's just saying it's unreliable. That's all he's saying. But there's no question that the date that Rich Green's interpretation of the data was that between 12, let's say 1210 and 1230 was when he was, was when John O'Keefe was moving around. Now that may, that he may have had a, a, a false interpretation of that data, but it has nothing to do with the data later on when the, when the cops picked up the phone and she's just an idiot for confusing that. She's an idiot for confusing that she doesn't do the most basic research that we've all had to do pouring through documents so we could so we could talk about this case in a somewhat coherent way because it's very difficult and you can tell the people who are trying to insert themselves into the story for whatever reason you can tell the people who are generally uh genuinely interested in getting to the truth who actually do the work and she's not one of them and you know she loves to do media you're right we should invite her on kevin we should get wendy murphy on here she would she loves to talk about herself i bet you she'd do it I mean, it's, no, I don't think so, because if she watched this, even, I mean, we'd, we'd tear her apart.
I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, she doesn't even have. She. I mean, I didn't. I don't think it came through in the beginning because I apologize for the interference. But she was saying now people just don't read the actual documents. Well, we have read the documents, and that's yeah. the problem. You haven't read the documents, Wendy. You right. you could do because you didn't understand them. I mean, there's no way. Listen, I dispute. I'm not sure if what Rich Green says is accurate. But I know he doesn't. He's not confused about the phone moving around after six thirty when the cops finally picked it up in the snow. Uh, you know, there there may be other questions about that data. Maybe the phone. Maybe the, like so, a health app might be confused when you're driving slowly or something like that. I don't know. Maybe there's some other reason for that app. You know, for for people having different conclusions on that. But it has nothing to do with what she said. And it's just, it's if you're gonna make a case, make it smart. <laughs> Do 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 the t smallest bit of research, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, All gonna, right, so we uh, got anything else we want to talk about? We have anything you want to mention about upcoming shows? Um, got a lot coming on Sandra Crispo, and that's all I can say right now. If you're interested in that case, bolo on us. Um, more on, more to come on on Birchmore. We're working on it hard. I feel like I'm working on Birchmore day and night right now because I'm so mm -hmm. wrapped up in that story. Um. My new book is done. It's available for pre-order right now. The aptly named I Have an Obsession. It is basically part memoir, part updating uh, monster. A um, lot of new information in there. A lot of personal stories um, about myself and the research in the book. I'm so proud of it. And um, So please yeah. order that book, guys, because actually that really helps in the sales. If you just pre-order, I, I don't know if you know that, Dave, that really helps in the, in the algorithm on Amazon. Is that available on Amazon to pre-order? It is available on Amazon for pre-order. I'm doing a special right now. The first 50 pre-orders are all autographed copies. Um, all right. And, I didn't even know that myself. So that's really yeah, that's Amazon awesome. allows you to do a lot of interesting things if your sales have been there and your reviews and all this other jazz. So mm -hmm. um, I certainly... Um, Really appreciate it, guys. I don't make a lot of money off books. I'm just going to be brutally honest with you. What I'm always the most interested in is people knowing the story. And um, next week, uh, five days from now, in fact, is the 47th anniversary of Andy Puglisi uh, going missing from Higgins Memorial Pool uh, in Lawrence. And um, Andy's still not home yet. And um, his family doesn't have a place to go to bury him. And um, it's been 47 Christmases, birthdays. Um, without Andy for that family. And um, best we can do is talk about it, write about it and and have people uh, that we listen, that listen to us and follow us and respect and, and um, trust us uh, know of the case. And um, that's really all it's about. It's not about making the most money or being famous or having people recognize me. It's about people knowing what we do and why we do it. And that's why 47 years on the 21st, Andy Puglisi went missing, nine years old. So. Well, congratulations on the book. And I also want to tell you guys that tentatively, we're going to be live tomorrow night, too. I have a new guest, someone that's going to be a new regular guest for us. She's joining us from Austin, Texas, and she's going to have on, this is a another unsolved murder in Gainesville, Florida. And she's going to have on the mother and I think the sister and a couple of other family members that are connected to this or some combination of that's going to be checking in. And we're going to discuss that case. Um, this is from a kind of a new member of our team named Paige. Uh, so hopefully that's still going on. I have to check with her tonight to make sure. Um, but thank you guys. And also then we, I think we're going to be back Saturday, Dave, after that. Yeah, we're going to have a whole slew of shows for you in the next couple of days. So been working on some stuff. We're trying to clear the decks and, um, is you know, it going to be Crispo Saturday? Or? Yeah, we're going to do Crispo on Saturday. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more. And um, hopefully, hopefully, depending on what she's doing, we're going to talk to Lana, who is um, Sandra's daughter, and get some updates on the case and where it stands five years later. And um, no citizen, the autograph copy does not cost any extra. Um, no, it's 22 bucks and, across all. Across and our, all. our dynamic researcher, Erin, has some big thing in the works for us that she was going to do Saturday, but then it's her actually her 40th birthday. I'm sorry, I mean 30th birthday <laughs> yes. Saturday. And so she forgot that. But so we'll, hopefully, we'll probably be doing that next week. We're And we're really looking forward to it because she is a dynamite researcher. And this one is something she's been working on for a long time. I don't even know what the case is. So, but I know it's going to be good. So we'll probably have that next week. Yeah, Wash uh, Hour is a. Uh, as a superhero and we want to give a special shout out to her husband steve who allows us to take up so much of her time and uh, we appreciate you steve and i want to thank robert hersey for a donation that came over the paypal thank you very much and it will go to good use immediately 
Um, we're, we got a lot of filming we're going to do over the next few days. So, guys, have a good night. Thank you very much. And we will probably see you tomorrow night, but we'll certainly see you soon.